Some people often ask me, why, why is the DA doing this now? But I, I actually think that if we had tried this 10 years ago, and we did start uh, you know, the steps in the right direction then, but it was a very diffi- a different judicial environment. And these services were not at such an advanced stage of total collapse. And I think that really is the key uh, uh, differentiator now that makes this a much more fruitful environment for, for us to press this advantage. The city of Cape Town wants to generate its own electricity. As load shedding sweeps through the country, the DA's mayoral candidate for the city of Cape Town, Jordan Hill Lewis, has put at the forefront of his campaign an end to load shedding for the city. I sat down with Jordan Hill Lewis in a recent episode of my podcast, Solutions with David and Sarah, and what follows is a short clip from this conversation. Enjoy. But now, how do we go about... uh, de-risking cities like Cape Town from uh, the kind of broader problems in the national economy. And I know that the centerpiece of your campaign has been about ending load shedding and maybe trying to take advantage of some of these new regulatory openings, the lifting of the cap on private electricity generation up to 100 megawatts. Uh, how do you propose going about that? What other, um, what, what other obstacles are potentially in your way that you will need to overcome? Yeah, well, the, I think the insight that I had that really uh, convinced me to stand and, and took me over the edge on this decision matrix was that, uh, you know, for three years, we've been waiting with bated breath for a wide ranging, significant reform agenda at a national level, and it isn't coming. And I don't think it's capable of of arriving under this leadership. Uh, and so the, the economic stag- stagnation and uh, lack of progress, I think, will will continue. So the logical next step from that is, well, how do you insulate, uh, you know, well run parts of the country from the devastation that that I spoke of earlier, that kind of slow bleed devastation on budgets and services that uh, that this implies. And the way to do that, I think, is to look at each of the worst handbrakes, as you call it, uh, I think very aptly so, each of the worst handbrakes or, or inhibitors to, to growth and see what can be done about that at a local level. And uh, energy is probably the one where there is a lot of scope and, and increasingly so given, given the regulatory amendments that you referred to, given uh, the, the fact that ESCOM 15 years later is still load shedding the country even right now as we speak. And uh, so I think there's lots of opportunity there to really insulate well-run parts of the country from the worst consequences of of uh, this, you know, this national state failure or this uh, this slow collapse and and backwards sliding, backsliding of of these essential services. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30-day free trial for more content from the CIA. So obviously, Cape Town has the Steenbras facility, which I think is a, a hydro plant. Uh, which yeah. uh, enables you to kind of create a bit of a buffer, so when the rest of the country is in stage one, you still have uh, you still have the lights on. But mm. how do you go about this? Um, how do you go about crowding in private generators? Uh, is there sufficient capital available? Private enterprises that are willing to uh, to get involved in this market? The, there is just a flood of very uh, favorable, a flood of money available at very favorable terms uh, for for these kind of projects. In fact, every time I do an interview about this, uh, almost without exception, I'm contacted by more and more, uh, whether it be foreign governments or foreign investors or local investors who are ready and willing and have all the technological ability and all of the funding already lined up to move into the space. The the reason for load shedding in South Africa, David, is not uh, a technological shortcoming. It is not a financial shortcoming. It is a political and governance shortcoming. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes me so cross about it, is that there's no good reason uh, for us to to have load shedding. We understand that it started from a place of insufficient investment in new generating capacity that then created a shortage which persists today. But there is an easily available solution which uh, which the government will not allow South Africans to access because essentially of of politics, and that I find unacceptable, and that's no good reason for a city to stand back and simply wait for national government to solve this. Uh, that's not going to happen. 
Okay, but nevertheless, uh, these regulatory uh, changes came from the national level, from the Department of uh, Mineral Resources and Energy. Gwede Mantash is the minister there. So, I mean, in many respects, you are kind of downstream from uh, some of those regulatory bodies that sit in mm. Pretoria. Um, but, you know, this is obviously a, a small uh, gap that you can, you can take. Uh, but what yes. other ways can you start to more aggressively start to assert the interests of the city uh, and push back against some of these more onerous uh, regulations? Yeah, uh, that's, that goes to the heart of my, my campaign. So, you know, what, what I saw is that there, there's a, as you say, there's a little opening, there's a little gap. Uh, the door is just ajar on energy. But even so, so, you know, let's give credit where it's due. That is a worthwhile and welcome reform, inch, an inch forward in the reform agenda. Uh, but even so, the, the, the amendments are so unclear and deliberately so, deliberately so, so as to frustrate the efforts of, of well-run cities to, to actually reduce their reliance on ESCOM and start buying uh, from independent power producers because the, the the process for actually doing so is still as clear as mud. But nevertheless, the, the door is ajar. And as I've said elsewhere, we've now got to go and push open that door firmly, kick it open, and and really push the boundaries on, uh, on energy and def not wait passively. This is, this is the key thing, not wait passively for these things to be clarified over time, but actually to clarify them in the act of doing them uh, and, in to, and to in, in, in that way invite challenge uh, and, and use the opportunity of challenge to clarify what the city's powers and rights and responsibilities are in terms of delivering basic services to its customers, the residents. And for me, that goes to, to several other uh, basic service areas as well. So, for example, the Constitution in Schedule 4 and 5 uh, includes the phrase uh, metropolitan public transport, but that has never ever been defined. And so cities have just by, by dint of tradition limited their public transport activities to, uh, to you know, what we now call BRT, bus rapid transit, uh, essentially bus systems. But the, that's never really been tested. That's never really been, uh, had, a, had a light shone on what these parts of the constitution actually mean in terms of what local governments can actually do uh, in, these, in these basic services. So what excites me is that uh, I see the significant parts of the constitution insofar as it relates to local governments and provincial powers as only now being uh, tested and defined and clarified and explored in a way. And that's very, very exciting as a, as a kind of new phase in, in South African governance. Uh, and so I want to do, do that again, not by standing on the back foot and waiting for these issues to become, uh, to come to court or, or, or to be clarified uh, by national government first, but actually moving forward uh, assertively to go and define them ourselves and on our terms. Uh, and I think that that applies to public transport, it applies to policing, it applies to power uh, and other other areas as well where we have the opportunity to do this. Okay, but now Jordan, I have my constitution here in front of me and I, I hate to be a bit of a wet blanket because this all sounds very good, but section 156 uh, says, 1562 says a municipality may make and administer bylaws for the effective administration of the matters which it has the right to administer. But then mm. subsection three says a bylaw that conflicts with national or provincial legislation is invalid. Uh, so that means that if there is some kind of conflict with another sphere of government, then that other sphere will override the city. Um, so, I mean, how do you, how do you circumvent some of those, those problems? Because I mean, would you need to necessarily go and, and litigate, for example, at the constitutional court to, to have a ruling on that, or, or would you just act and, and wait for the inevitable reaction from national? Uh, so, you know, the constitution also says that uh, uh, local and provincial governments need to take uh, means necessary to deliver services uh, to their residents. And 
the the services that are essential for residents uh, are some of those services which national government is just blatantly failing to deliver like adequate policing and uh, electricity and public transport system rail transport so i do believe yes uh, that there will have to be some really defining uh, court battles and challenges to shine a torchlight into these parts of the constitution and check exactly what they mean and have them defined but i'm I am far from certain that the that the law is uh, so unambiguously on the side of the national government. If you look around the country, what is happening, we're also seeing a change in the kind of judicial environment where uh, ratepayers' bodies, for example, are, are winning the legal rights to deliver services in their towns uh, because the local government is failing so spectacularly. We've even had NGOs like Gift of the Givers winning legal rights to deliver services in towns where local government has failed spectacularly. So I think that if we had tried this 10 years ago, and some people often ask me, why, why is the DA doing this now? But I, I actually think that if we had tried this 10 years ago, and we did start uh, you know, the steps in the right direction then, but it was a very diff a different judicial environment. And these services were not at such an advanced stage of total collapse. And I think that really is the key uh, uh, differentiator now that makes this a much more fruitful environment for, for us to press this advantage. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this analysis and you would like to watch the full interview with Jordan Hill Lewis, you can do so by clicking on this link. And I'd also be grateful if you could subscribe to my other channel that's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. Until next time, take care.